Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Parral, I'm Chief Economist and General Manager of the Research Department at the Inter-American Development. I'd like to welcome you to the first virtual seminar in our research and policy series. I would like to start by thanking IDB President Luis Alberto Moreno and Professor Nuria Rubini for making time in their business schedules to talk with us today. Last week, we launched our 2020 Latin American and the Caribbean Macroeconomic Report, which discusses the impact of the coronavirus on our economies and recommends a specific set of policies to steer us through this crisis. The response to this report has been truly phenomenal. Within just two weeks of launching the publication, we have achieved roughly half the number of downloads of our previous report generated in a whole year. Why is this? There are different explanations, of course. Uh, one is quality. And I have to say that this year's report is really useful and timely. But I think the most likely explanation is also the most obvious one. There is a tremendous demand for information regarding where we are in this crisis and what we can expect in the coming months and years. And it's easy to understand why there is a such demand. We are in the middle of a crisis of dramatic proportions. Countries in the region have implemented a number of crucial actions to tackle the spread of the coronavirus. Some countries actually seem to have a pretty good handle on controlling the virus, but flattening the curve of infections comes at significant cost. The social distancing measures implemented across the region are taking a significant toll on our economies. And this toll is not only large, but is also unevenly distributed. Many high-income individuals have been able to telework or at least to weather the storm by tapping into their savings. But low-income individuals are facing enormous challenges. They typically need to leave their homes to work, they have limited savings, and they live in overcrowded dwellings. The situation is truly difficult. Against this background today, more than ever, we need to connect the worlds of research and policy. And this is exactly the idea behind our research and policy seminar series. Our vision for these seminars is to focus on the most important economic and social challenges and to bring in the brightest minds that can help us think about how to tackle them. The motivation to launch this series was strong last year, but now in the face of the coronavirus crisis, this motivation is even stronger. We are navigating uncharted waters. Countries have faced many fiscal crises, monetary crises, and debt crises, but this one is different. We are facing a sudden, drastic global economic slowdown in an environment of extreme uncertainty and volatility. We may be facing the most severe economic and social crisis since the Great Depression. Now, what is the economic situation for developing countries, and more specifically for countries in Latin America and the Caribbean? What are their most important challenges? And what could be potential actions for countries to tackle these challenges? We know these are difficult questions, which is why we're excited to have President Moreno and Professor Rubini join us today to tackle them. And despite the fact that he clearly doesn't need an introduction, let me tell you a few things about our dear guest, Professor Nuriel Rubini. Nuriel is a professor of economics at New York University, my alma mater, and he's also the CEO of Rubini Macro Associate, a global macroeconomic consultancy firm in New York, as well as co-founder of Ross and Rubini Associates based out of London. It is important to remember that in 2006, addressed to the International Monetary Fund, Nuriel warned of the impending recession due to the credit and housing market bubble. His predictions of this upside down balance sheets became a reality in 2008 with the bubble bursting and reverberating around the world into global financial crisis. He was right not only predicting the global financial crisis of 2008-2009, but he was also right about the fundamentals behind this crisis. This is even more difficult than predicting the next crisis. Nuriel represents perfectly the rationale behind our research and policy seminars because he has combined rigorous economic research with great influence in policy around the world. That's why having predicted one crisis, Nuriel's insights on how to get ourselves out of the current crisis are particularly relevant. Nuriel, in his presentation, will discuss about the alphabetic possibilities of economic recovery around the world, B, U, W, or L-shaped. What a task. But before handing over the floor to him, let me make one final point. In the middle of this global crisis, institutions such as the IDV 
have an ever more important role to play. The problems faced by our countries are similar in nature, clearly not identical, but with greater commonalities and differences. And more than ever, our problems are connected. And this means that thinking from a regional or global perspective is of great importance. I want to close this remark emphasizing that we are incredibly honored to have both Nouriel and President Moreno here today. So Nouriel will have 20 minutes and then for a presentation and will then be joined for a conversation with President Moreno. So without further ado, Nouriel, the floor is yours, or I have to say the screen is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be able to do this event uh, with you, Eric, and with President Moreno. I have great respect uh, for the Inter-American Development Bank, many friends and colleagues, and the times are interesting, so it's an honor and pleasure being here today. And of course, one could speak hours about uh, each one of these topics. For example, this morning, I have a research service called nurieltoday.com, and I spent literally one hour and a half discussing what's happening in the oil market and why yesterday we saw the May future W2I uh, uh, contract going to negative price. Times are so weird that we had negative prices for oil of minus 40. So these are the kind of things that are very, very volatile, extreme that are happening right now. This is a very different crisis from others. Of course, I'm not going to spend an hour and a half talking about oil in 20 minutes. I have to give you a bit of an overview of what's going on in the global economy. And the way I would think about it this way, uh, you have to ask yourself, what's going to be the shape of this uh, recession? Because we know there'll be a global recession. And what's going to be the shape of the economic recovery? And to simplify, it's a little bit of a simplification, I would say there are potentially three scenarios. Uh, scenario number one is what I call a greater recession. Greater recession because it's more severe than the global financial crisis, and it looks like, uh, in terms of depth of the economic contraction, like the beginning of the Great Depression. It's not going to be as long, but it's a very severe greater recession. And I call this greater recession a U-shaped recession, because not only will have a very sharp downturn in economic activity, but because I believe, for reason I'm going to explain briefly, that the economic recovery from this crisis, the recovery is going to start in the second half of the year, is going to be anemic, subpar below trend. So you have a very sharp drop now, but then the recovery is going to be very anemic. That's what I call a greater recession. And I would say that's my baseline, to which I would assign a 60% probability. There is an upside scenario that is the one that is being priced in by the market. If you listen to some of the sell-side research, they now admit that there'll be a severe recession. There's been a free fall in economic activity, but they believe that the recovery is going to be very strong and robust, not only in the second half of the year, but into 2021-22. Take even the new revised estimates of the IMF. The IMF says this year is going to be terrible the worst economic growth we had in decades, global growth minus 3%. We have not even had that negative growth during the global financial crisis, but then they do expect that global growth next year is gonna be 5.8%, almost double of the trend growth in the global economy that is around 3.5, 3.6. So they believe there's gonna be a massive, strong recovery v shape. This year we fall 3%, Next year, we go up by almost 4%. That's what I call a V-shaped recovery. There is a third scenario that I call the risk, and that's a, the upside scenario is what I call a mild V-shaped recession. The third scenario is the one in which there is a risk of what I call a greater depression, free fall now, and then you stagnate, something similar to the Great Depression. Now, the probability of a greater depression right now is low. My view is not more than 20%. My baseline of a U-shaped recession, in my view, is the baseline, 60% probability. But the way I differ from the consensus, from Wall Street, and I would say even from the IMF, is that I believe that the upside scenario of a V-shaped recovery of the global economy, where you're going to go to rapid return to growth and well above trend growth next year and beyond, is very unlikely. I would assign to this V-shaped recovery, 
a 20% probability. So let me explain, and we know exactly the dynamic of this recession, why there has been a free fall of economic activity. Suddenly, to flatten the curve and to stop the spread of the contagion to different degrees, all countries in the world have had policies of social isolation, shelter in place, of uh, mitigation, of trying to keep people away from home, uh, at home, away from work. And of course, that shutdown, that sudden stop has led to a free fall of GDP, of consumption, of residential investment, of capital spending, of exports, of income, of imports, and all elements of economic activity. It's like a free fall. Initially, it was like an eye, a free fall, and now maybe it's going to bottom out in the second quarter and start to recover in the third quarter. We have not seen anything like this before. It took three years during the global financial crisis and the Great Depression for having a free fall of output, of consumption, of investment, for having unemployment rate going to 10, 20%. Stuff that had took three years in the global financial crisis or in, during the Great Depression didn't take three years, didn't take three months, it took three weeks. We've had in four weeks, unemployment claim in the United States rising by 22 million. Output in the first quarter is estimated to fall at the annual rate of 8%, but even Wall Street says that output in the second quarter in the US GDP is gonna fall at the annual rate between 30 and 40% at the annual rate. The rise in unemployment rate is gonna lead the unemployment rate to 10, maybe 15, 20% by the summer, the collapse of retail sales, of uh, durable spending, of auto sales, of residential investment, of capital spending. Korea, leading indicator of the global economy, has seen a collapse of its exports and imports. It's a barometer of what's happening in the global economy. So it was like a free fall. So everybody agrees that it's gonna be a free fall in the first and the second quarter. The question is what's the shape of the recovery from the third quarter on? The optimists say V, we're going to rapidly grow very fast in the second half of the year into 2021. I think the recovery in the second half is going to be anemic and it's going to be continuing to be anemic. Maybe growth a trend in the global economy, say three, three and a half percent next year, not the 5.8 percent estimated by the, by the IMF and by the consensus on Wall Street. Let me summarize briefly why I think that the recovery is going to be anemic in spite of the fact that, of course, there is a significant amount of monetary stimulus, a significant amount of fiscal stimulus, a significant amount of support of credit to illiquid but solvent households and firms. And of course, that stimulus is more drastic in advanced economies, is less strong in emerging markets, because as you know, emerging markets, for a number of reasons, have less fiscal space, they have less monetary space, Many of them don't have the same policy credibility. And when this risk is off, money comes out of emerging markets. So the tightening of financial conditions in emerging markets is more severe than advanced economies. Say in the US, following the policy stimulus, now there is a recovery of some risky assets like US and other types of equities. Instead, if you're looking at the emerging markets, the sudden stop and the outflow of money means weaker currency, longer bond yields for sovereign and corporate in foreign currency, and also, of course, in, le in local currency. And while the ECB, the Fed, the BOJ can do zero rate, negative rates, monetize large fiscal deficits of the order of 10, 15 percent of GDP, of course, emerging markets that have less monetary and fiscal space can do less of that. Uh, they have a lot of dollar liabilities. They don't have access uh, to essentially the same kind of a land last resort support that is available in advanced economies. The question is who's going to be the international land of last resort for the emerging markets, IMF, the IDB, the World Bank, what are the resources that are going to be available and so on. So there are meaningful differences between advanced economies and emerging markets. But let me explain why even for the advanced economies where the policy stimulus is going to be massive, aggressive, front-loaded, of the sort we have seen currently in the United States, in the Eurozone, in the UK, in Japan and other G10 countries, even in these countries, the recovery is gonna be very anemic. I think there are several reasons. In a recent paper I present 
14 reasons. Let me summarize some of the key ones. Reason number one, by the time we are going to restore some economic activity, it's going to reopen during the summer, say July and August, there is a risk that it's going to be a second mini wave of the spread of the contagion because some countries may restart economic activity too soon because there is a pressure political to open up a business, schools, and economic activity. Secondly, this virus started in the Northern Hemisphere, but it's likely that it's going to move to the Southern Hemisphere when the winter in the Southern Hemisphere is going to start in a couple of months, and then it's going to return again to the Northern Hemisphere during the fall of this year, November and December. By then, we're not gonna have a vaccine. We don't know whether antivirals or anti-inflammatory are gonna be working, and therefore, there's gonna be a mini wave in the summer and another wave in the winter, until eventually, maybe a year, a year and a half from now, we're gonna have a vaccine. So the problem is that we're not gonna be able to fully control this, this virus. It's gonna come back in some mutation, and therefore, economic activity may restart and stop again, and start again, and stop again. The other important point I think is to keep in mind is the following one. Consumers today around the world are totally shell-shocked. Many of them at the loss of income and jobs, and even when income is gonna start again, they're not gonna have the same income and the same jobs as before. Most likely, their incomes are gonna be lower, the wages are gonna be lower. And they left to have precautionary savings, because many people don't have any cash balances for an emergency. And now that you know you can get sick because of the virus or lose a job, you'll have to have precautionary savings. So people have less income, they save more, they consume less, and therefore the return of demand from consumption is going to be less than otherwise. So in the private sector, households are going to save more and they're going to invest less. And by investment mean their purchases of home. This is the main form of accumulation of real assets. The same kind of stuff is gonna happen in the corporate sector. Many corporations today are highly leveraged, small ones, middle-sized, large ones. And to survive, and millions of the smaller ones are gonna go bankrupt, but even if you want to survive, you have to reduce leverage. You have to cut cost, and you have to try to increase your savings but you also have to cut your cap capital spending because there is an option value of waiting. You don't know whether the virus is gonna come back again. So if you look at the financial balances of households and corporates, both of them will have to increase their precautionary savings, spend less and save more. Both of them will have to reduce their capital spending, residential investment for the household sector, capital spending for the corporate sector. So. Increase in saving, reduction in capex means slower recovery, right? It's like what happened after the global financial crisis when you had deleveraging from very high debt levels. You had to do the same process this time around. You have to save more, you have to spend less, you have to do less capex to reduce your debt and leverage in the private sector, in the corporate sector, in the household sector, even in some parts of the financial sector. And therefore, the recovery is going to be anemic as you have this process of deleveraging. Unfortunately, in spite of the help the government is going to give, many small businesses are going to go bust. Because if you're shutting down a store or a restaurant for three or four months, you may not pay rent or mortgage for three or four months, but then you have to pay it back. And many of these businesses are on a very small margin and they're not gonna be able to have the same customers and revenues once they gradually reopen. So even if we say we're gonna provide them liquidity and lending to illiquid but solvent firms and households, many of these households and firms are gonna be illiquid and insolvent, and whether we like it or not, there'll be massive bankruptcies. So the other thing about this crisis is global. Usually when there is a recession, in one part of the world, there may be growth in the second part of the world. There may be a recession in Europe, but boom in Asia and emerging markets and the United States and vice versa. This is a shock that hit every single economy of the world at the same time in a synchronized way. And when it's synchronized, the impact is more severe and the recovery is gonna be weaker. The crisis, unfortunately, as I pointed out, is gonna hit even more severely emerging market economies and frontier economies that are more fragile than advanced economies. They do have less access to capital markets. Many of them 
have liability dollarization, they have less access to dollar liquidity, and they have less policy space in terms of both macroeconomic policies, monetary, fiscal, and credit, and of course, in terms of their health and medical resources in order to deal with uh, a spread of the contagion. There is also less, there is more density of population. Poor people live under very cramped quarters, and therefore doing social distancing is not going to be easy. I think that also what's going to be happening is that after the global financial crisis, we provided liquidity and capital and reduced leverage to banks. We said the banks are in better shape. Unfortunately, however, given the U-shaped recovery, many firms are going to go bust. Many households are going to go bust. And therefore, the non-performing loans in the banking system are also going to be rising. And therefore, the risk is of a credit crunch. And even providing liquidity to the financial system is not going to be sufficient. There will be a slowdown. The other impact is going to be that earnings of the corporate sector are going to be in a free fall and they're going to be recovering very anemically. And therefore, the cost of capital in terms of not just debt, but also equity financing for the corporate sector around the world is going to be uh, higher than otherwise. Two other important points. This crisis, unfortunately, is going to lead to more deglobalization, more decoupling between US and China, more fragmentation of the global economy, more of a reshoring of economic activity, more of a balkanization of global supply chain, not just in tech, in industry, manufacturing, but also in services. We had recently a populist backlash against globalization, against trade, against migration, against even liberal democracy, against technological innovation. We saw riots and protests in the streets, not just in advanced economies, but also, say, in many parts of Latin America. Unfortunately, those trends have led to policies that are inward-oriented, protectionist, and of restricting the movement of goods, of services, of capital, of labor, of data, of information and technology. And every country is going to say, I'm going to protect my workers, I'm going to protect my firms, and therefore we're going to have more nationalistic and more protectionist policies. And that's going to restrict the growth of trade and it's going to hurt countries that are small open economy that benefit from global trade. And unfortunately, populist leaders, both in advanced economies and emerging market, might become more popular and follow more populist inward-oriented policies going to have negative impact on potential growth. So we've reached peak globalization after the global financial crisis. I fear that we're going to have an intensification of deglobalization, fragmentation, balkanization of inward-oriented policies of protectionists. Final point, there are also political and geopolitical uh, risk in the global economy. There is the strategic rivalry between US and China, the Cold War, the tension in the Middle East between US and Iran. Uh, there is this political backlash even against liberal democracy. Liberal democracy right now is a threat and you have authoritarian regime that say, we have a better economic, social, <coughs> and political model and populist leader may become more populist and have policies that are like negative supply shock that reduce potential growth. So in summary, my unfortunate view is that for all of these reasons, not only the recession is severe, we all agree on that. I think on the, the first leg down, uh, whether you believe in a V or a U or an L, the free fall is gonna be severe. The question is, what's gonna be the shape of the recovery? I fear that for the reason I discussed, the shape of the recovery is gonna be very anemic and it's gonna be even more anemic in emerging market economies that do not have the macro space and the healthcare facilities that advanced economies have. But even in advanced economies, the recovery is going to be very, very anemic rather than being V-shaped. And there are some tail risks that can lead this greater recession, this U-shape, in becoming an L-shaped greater depression. This is not my baseline, but unfortunately, that's one of the risks we're facing. Now, emerging markets, and we're going to discuss it maybe a little bit more in the conversation now, will face a huge amount of challenges. Of course, 
you cannot lump them together. Some have better fundamentals, some of them less, some have stronger institutions, some of them have weaker. But one of the shocks is not only capital outflows out of EM, but collapse of oil prices, collapse of metal prices, collapse of uh, even agricultural prices, less so. But many of these emerging markets, including Latin America, are energy or commodities or agricultural exporters. Many of them generate a lot of revenues and income from tourism, say in the Caribbean, that's going to be shut down. And some of them also have a significant amount of income coming from remittances. And given the loss of jobs and so on, and restriction to migration, even the income from remittances is going to be falling sharply. So these emerging markets in general, and the weaker ones, and some of them in Latin America, and we know what are the more fragile ones, are going to face significant economic, financial, and social challenges. And we have to have the right policies to make sure that they don't lead to even more situation of insolvency, if not bankruptcy, and of economic and financial damage. I'll stop here, and thank you for giving me a chance to present myself. Thank you. Thank you very you much. It's, uh, it's very uh, sobering, everything that you have said. And, and let's begin where you ended, because I think the co you just described all of the shocks that Latin America is getting from the compression of prices of commodities, yeah. uh, mineral commodities or food commodities, the drop in remittances, uh, the drop in tourism. Uh, but there's another angle here, and that is the whole question of uh, you know, you have, in a way, everybody trying to, to essentially uh, flatten the curve of the spread of the virus, but the one curve that is not flattening is debt. It is debt on households, it is debt on corporates, uh, it is debt on governments, uh, and, and this, of course, is going to be a major issue going forward. You followed, you know, the debt crisis in Latin America. There's been a lot of conversation about, you know, can central banks print money as far as they want? What are the, the if, you, if you were talking to a handful of finance ministers of countries that are still investment grade, where what they are facing now is a sudden stop of financing, uh, which by the way, eventually over time, if, this uh, recovery is anemic, as you say, uh, uh, anemic and uneven. Uh, we're going to be facing a, a problem of, of uh, financing that can become uh, not only a liquidity problem, but a solvency problem. How do you see us working through all of that? Um, um, Luis Alberto, very important question. And um, I'll give you some of my thoughts and I'd love to hear about also how you think about it. Uh, first of all, you validly said you cannot lump all emerging markets, including in Latin America, in one group. There are some where investment grade, uh, some of them have better policies, both macro and structural, uh, and other ones have uh, more fundamental problems. So, uh, and that's going to be across emerging markets and from some of the frontier economies. And we know actually there are some very poor countries that are highly indebted. Some of them are maybe in Sub-Saharan Africa, but I think there may be a few of them even in Central America and in the Caribbean that are gonna have debt ratios that are so high that they're gonna require debt relief, not only for the private sector, but also from the public sector. And there is already an initiative for the IMF to take in the lead together with other institutions like yours to make sure that the debt burden of those that are really very poor and highly indebted is gonna be uh, reduced. But those are smaller, smaller economies. Now you pointed out, we have a debt problem, and it could be debt of the public sector, debt of the private sector, within the private sector could be corporates, could be households, could be banks, could be non-bank financial institutions, and some countries, the country debt, because they have borrowed a lot from abroad if they had large external deficit. Now there is a big difference between advanced economies and uh, most emerging markets. In the US, in the Eurozone, in Japan, we have effectively moved to helicopter drop of money or what people call modern monetary theory or essentially monetization of large fiscal deficit. We can run a budget deficit of 10, 15 percent of GDP in US, in Europe, in Japan, in Canada, and we can essentially monetize it fully by doing unlimited QE. Now, it's not called the helicopter drop, but what's the difference between 
large monetization of fiscal deficit directly or indirectly through QE. In one case, you buy the bonds in the primary market. In the other one, you buy the bonds in the secondary market. But effectively, that's what you're doing. Now, advanced economies, they borrow in their own currency. They have more credibility. They have more fiscal space. They have uh, inflation rates close to zero. They can monetize them. They have a massive slack in economic activity. You print money, large budget deficit, you prevent a severe deflation and a depression. So for a while, at least you can do it. Emerging markets instead, they have less policy credibility. Some of them have a history of inflation, of devaluation, of defaults, or you name it, some of them, all of them, many of them are regained. Some of them are still liability dollarized. Many of them have borrowed in foreign currency. Uh, the room for fiscal and monetary stimulus is more limited. Of course, if you are investment grade, you can ease monetary policy. You can do more fiscal stimulus, but not to the extent like the US or Europe or Japan. If you're not investment grade, you're much more constrained. And if you ease too much, currency freefall, balance sheet effects, and the real value of your dollar debt goes to the roof, and then you become insolvent. And, and you have also imbalances like twin fiscal and current account deficits, a lack of credibility. So the weaker emerging markets are really in trouble because they need help and they don't have much policy space. The better investment grade emerging markets, they have policy space, but it's not the same policy space as advanced economies. And when the risk is golf and capital is flowing out of emerging markets, discriminating between better and worse credit becomes less easy. And even some of the better credits are subject to large terms of trade shocks because you are exporting uh, copper or oil or agricultural commodities or others. So some of the shock can eat even the better credits. And we know that the region overall last year had a very bad year because of the global condition was supposed to recover this year. Last year, there was also phenomenon of social instability even in some of the more stable economies like, say, Chile or Colombia, you had demonstrations, let alone the kind of turmoil, of course, that you see in places like Venezuela or Argentina. And therefore, even the better credits right now are slightly more fragile. I think that the IMF, the World Bank, the IDB and other institutions have to have a key role because the Fed can do swap lines with... Uh, uh, ECB with BOJ with BOE and a few emerging markets, but it cannot essentially do the swap lines with every emerging market. There is a problem of dollar illiquidity. Everybody with dollar debts now has to cover themselves because the fall in the value of the currency implies balance sheet effects, and somebody has to lend you money in dollar. And therefore, if the Fed is not going to do it, you need an international land of last resort. That's where your institution, the World Bank, the IMF, have to play, play a key role. The problem is that the current capital of some of these institutions may not uh, uh, allow you to lend as much as needed. And therefore, recapitalizing and providing more options for these institutions to lend more to fragile emerging market is going to be very important. Real. As I listened to you, I was thinking about volatility because you're describing your scenario of the uneven recovery. Largely, you're going to have, if that's the scenario that you attribute 60%, there's certainly going to be a lot of volatility. And typically, that volatility goes somewhere. But eventually, with all of that volatility out there, you know, the appetite for risk begins to drop. How do you see how, especially for emerging markets, even for those that we were describing that are investment grade, and, and you're correct that, they, that, that the systemically risky countries like, uh, Argent, uh, like uh, Brazil or Mexico already have swap lines. Uh, with yeah. the, uh, I know that the fund is studying some alternatives to do it for other countries, and they've been doing amazing things, as, as you know, uh, and they're the right institution and they're fit for purpose in this regard. But as that one is, where will this volatility go? And more importantly, how can you get, uh, what are your, your, your limited capacity of growth? Where do you see it through government spending? Well, you know, the, the volatility is that, as we know, whenever there are uh, risk of episodes, uh, all sorts of risky assets go down, but usually risky assets in emerging market economies go down faster 
than those in advanced economies because there is essentially a uh, risk off, there is a sudden stop of capital, crossover investors tend to essentially move back home, even dedicated funds that have losses on Argentina or another country tend to essentially uh, get back home. And what has happened, by the way, is the interesting thing. In the last few weeks, we, with the exception of the last two days, uh, after the shock where there was a drawdown in US and global equity, 35%, from late March until two days ago, we were in risk on, right? US and global equity were going higher. Uh, you had the credit spreads for things like uh, RMBSs, Mooney bonds, high grade, even, even a high yield credit, the spreads were narrowing, right? You had the, the, the DM sovereign in the peripheral of Eurozone, the spreads narrowing. So you had a V-shaped recovery with risk on in DM assets, both equities and spread products. However, when you look at emerging markets, uh, even when there was the V-shaped recovery with the risk on the last few weeks, the emerging markets didn't look like a V, like equities or credit in advanced economies. They look like an L. If you look at, say, EM currencies or oil or other commodities, they've gone down free fall and now they're stagnating there. So that's, that's the thing that is a big difference, that emerging markets, now that there was a period of risk on, they've not recovered the same way they recover when there is usually risk on and they recover faster. And I think it's in part because, one, they don't have the same policy space. The recovery in advanced economies has been a V for asset prices, not for the real economy because you have a massive policy stimulus. Instead, in emerging markets, you don't have it. The ability of providing fiscal, monetary credit is limited, and people know that also the ability of doing social distancing, of flattening the curve, and the space that healthcare system have in some of these emerging markets, not all of them, is more limited. So, so we have seen essentially, in spite of the recent risk on, we have had an L in most of these emerging market risky assets, whether currencies, local currency debt, sovereign spreads, and of course, oil, metals, and other commodity prices. So unfortunately, the volatility is going to emerging markets. And of course, it's going to those that are the weakest emerging markets. They're not gonna be recovering as fast, but even the stronger emerging markets have issues, right? Mexico, because of the integration of trade with the United States, and the US is gonna have the weakness in the real economy, and now shutting down the border is gonna be hurting. Those that are exporters of copper, industrial metals, or even soybeans, let alone oil and energy, and there are many of them in emerging markets, especially in Latin America, are gonna be hurting. Those that are all importing in the region, however, have tourism and remittances, and those are gonna disappear. So maybe all prices are lower, but you're not gonna have tourism and remittances, so you're gonna be hurt in the Caribbean because of that. So unfortunately, even with the recovery we're seeing in asset prices, that is not justified by fundamentals because the economy is gonna be a U, therefore a V-shaped recovery in credit and equity is not justified. We don't see yet that recovery in emerging markets like we've seen in previous episodes that suggests that people worry that many of these emerging markets are more fragile fundamentally. Well, uh, we have a lot of questions coming from the audience, but I like uh, that you talk a little bit about oil. Uh, you just mentioned it. Nobody uh, thought that we would be the way we are this week with oil prices. Nobody would thought in our lifetime that we would see this. Why did this happen? And are we going to see more surprises like this one? Uh, well, uh, it's an interesting question. I had another one of these webinars this morning, and I spent literally one hour and a half discussing what happened with the oil market, both yesterday and also overall this year. So, you know, if you're interested to have the full answer, I would say just go to nuriel.today.com and you can listen for an hour and a half. But let me give you the punchline because of course we cannot spend an hour and a half discussing oil, but I literally spent an hour and a half discussing just oil. I think that there is what happened yesterday with negative prices that is a freak phenomenon, why? you have still too much production in the United States, demand has collapsed, and this uh, future price, WTI, is for physical delivery of oil in the middle of nowhere. It's Cushing, Oklahoma, 
where there is no storage capacity. So people who were long on the contract, essentially, uh, were trying to sell it because they want, didn't want to get physical delivery, but nobody wanted to buy their contract because there is nowhere to store the oil in the middle of nowhere. The storage capacity, even the pipeline are full. Therefore, the price went negative, severely short. However, leaving aside this particular freakish episode that could repeat itself even in June, think about the fundamental of oil. Oil was 60, 65 at the beginning of the year. Right now it's below 20, even for June or July delivery. What has happened? Initially it was a supply shock. The breakdown of the OPEC plus deal between Russia, Saudi and the rest of OPEC. But that increased only the supply of oil by 3 million dollar, 3 million barrels a day in March and April. The price instead went from 60, 65 to 20, has lost uh, two thirds. Actually today we price it to 15 is 70% loss. What has happened is because of the severe recession, there's been a destruction of demand. Nobody's driving, you're locked at home. There is no aviation, therefore demand for jet fuel has gone to zero. Actually they're sending jet fuel today to places in Africa because people can use it as a, for cooking purposes, kerosene and so on, because no, nobody's flying, literally. That's what they're doing with the excess supply of jet fuel. So demand for oil has fallen between 20 and 25 million barrels per day. The market at the beginning of the year was in equilibrium, 90 million per day of supply, 90 million of demand. Supply went up by three, demand fell by 20, 25, the price has collapsed below 20. Now, they reached a new OPEC deal on April 12th, but in spite of this OPEC deal, the price has not gone up, it's gone even down. June and July still 15 to 20. Why? You're reducing supply only by 10 million barrels a day around OPEC plus. Maybe North America, between US, Canada, and Mexico, many of them are gonna go out of business. Supply is gonna fall by another 3 million barrels a day. So you're reducing supply by 13, but the man is falling by 2025. So the oil market, even with this new OPEC deal, is still having massive excess supply. There's not enough demand and there is nowhere to put the oil. If you produce more than you supply, you have to store it. And around the world, we're essentially running out of storage capacity, given the massive gap between supply and demand. And therefore prices are gonna go lower. Now, the hope is that as we reopen the economy, in the second half of the year, gradually, the demand is going to rise and the effect of the OPEC plus deal is going to imply less production and gradually more demand. So if you look at the futures curve, for June is 15, but July is 20, and by December, the number is 30, 35. That means that the market is pricing in demand rising and supply being lower. However, Given what happened in May and what's happening today to the June pricing, when from 21 to 13, there is a risk that things are going to snowball. And if the recovery is going to be more anemic, the price in December is not going to be 35, might be still having a 25 handle or so. Because if the recovery is global, is anemic, the price are not going to rise as much. And that's my worry, that even the December contracts are too optimistic about how much there'll be a recovery of the global economy, recovery of global demand for oil, and recovery of oil prices. It all depends on how strong is the global economic recovery. But that's what's happening right now in the oil market. Thank you, Oriol, very much. Have, there's a couple of questions here around uh, questions of inflation and can uh, the monetization of deficits uh, will they lead to inflation and uh, questions of uh, the consequences of inflationary uh, financing, in, in, uh, especially in emerging markets in Latin America? Okay, uh, let me answer it this way. Uh, first of all, I would separate again between countries that have uh, policy credibility and countries that don't. If you are a United States and you are uh, the reserve currency and for a year or two, you're gonna have a budget deficit of 15% of GDP. And the Fed has already said, we're gonna fully monetize it because it's said infinite QE, unlimited. In the US, that monetization of a large budget deficit is not gonna cause inflation in the short run because we have slacking goods market, slacking labor market, massive unemployment, massive 
excess capacity and what the monetization of fiscal deficit is going to do, helicopter drop is going to do, is to avoid a depression and avoid severe deflation. So that's what's going to be doing. But suppose that you are an emerging market economy that has zero policy credibility with history of inflation, devaluation, depreciation, the basement of the currency and so on, then the same policy, 15% of GDP deficit fully monetized, gets you first to high inflation and then hyperinflation. Look at the history of places like Venezuela, Argentina and Zimbabwe just in the last few years. So a key thing is the policy credibility and things that you can do because you have the credibility in advanced economies Unfortunately, you cannot do them in emerging markets. Certainly, you cannot do them in the worst credits, but even a good credit like Chile or Colombia cannot run 15% of GDP and monetize it. Eventually, the currency goes into a free fall. So unfortunately, these are a luxury that these countries don't have, even the better ones. Now, however, in the short run, this is a collapse of demand and a slack of capacity. So you avoid depression and deflation. But even in advanced economies, over time, I fear that deglobalization, protectionism, balkanization, fragmentation, decoupling is like, like a negative supply shock that reduces potential output and increases the cost of production because you're going to move production from low cost places to high cost places like US and Europe. That's what reshoring is going to occur. So you're going to essentially create a situation with lower potential growth and higher cost of production. We know that whenever you have a negative supply shock and you fiscalize it and you monetize it, eventually you end up into stagflation, recession and inflation. That happened even in advanced economies in the 1970s. You remember, you had two negative supply shock, oil shock in 73, 79. The policy response was fiscal deficit and let's have monetary easing because we didn't want to have a recession. We monetized fiscal deficit and we ended up with stagflation, recession, and double-digit inflation. So in the short run, you can monetize fiscal deficit in advanced economies because you're fighting depression and deflation. But if over time, as I expect, one of the consequences of the crisis is negative supply shocks, then if you monetize them and you fiscalize them, even in the US, even in Europe, eventually, by next year, 2022, you may end up into inflation rather than deflation, into stagflation, and that would be like a return to the 1970s. And of course, that will be a nightmare because then advanced economy start to look like emerging markets. That's a risk that you cannot underestimate. Yeah. And by the way, I gave another talk just last week on the topic of modern monetary theory and of helicopter drop of money. I spoke for an hour and a half. Most people don't smoke for more than two minutes. I spend an hour and a half. So if you want to know more about this topic for an hour and a half, uh, go to nurieltoday.com. Uh, there is a long uh, lecture on that particular topic. <laughs> but this is the brief summary of it. So we have modern uh, monetary theory and oil for anybody who wants to go deeper, an hour and a half of each by, by brilliantly described by Nuriel. There's a lot of questions about this issue that you put about deglobalization, China. What does that mean for Latin America? But more importantly, is there an opportunity to as, as this change and, and connectivity to China and this, as you call it, the peak to globalization that happened at the financial crisis, are we in a moment where you could say, not just made in, the Ameri in, in America, but made in the Americas, that we can integrate much better supply chains on medical equipment and all these things that have evolved? And, and where do you see the role of China in all of these vis-a-vis -vis Latin America and the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis Latin America? Well, as you know, unfortunately, the U.S. policies in the last few years have been buy American, hire American, America first, uh, protectionism, restriction to migration, to trade in goods, in services, in capital, in labor, in technology. And some of them have hit not only uh, Mexico, but also other countries. The restriction to exports of steel and aluminum and so on that hit also part of Latin America. Now... My view is that the U.S. has to have a vision for the Americas. Because if you think about it, even the countries in Latin America that are politically closer to the United States and are either implicit or explicit allies of the United States, and many of them are liberal democracies that are friendly to the United States, 
Today, these countries do more trade, more investment, more financial links, more FDI with China than they do with the United States. And China has been very active in doing, say, public investment and building infrastructure all over the Caribbean, all over Central America, all over Latin America. And of course, when you're exporting oil and copper and raw materials and soybeans and agricultural products, most of these things go to China. So the US has essentially ignored, in many ways, Latin America. Yes, they have uh, re renegotiated finally the NAFTA, the new UMCA, at least that happened. That's good news. But my fear is that even countries that are, in terms of economic system and political system and overall foreign policy, friendly to the United States, today they are much more interconnected economically, financially, trade, business, investment, aid, and whatever not. And tomorrow, even in, in, in pharma, China is a major producer of pharma products, going to export them all over Latin America or help them. So either the US has a vision that even in a world in which there is less globalization and we have more regionalization, you have to have a region that is not just North America, but is a region that is all of the America. If instead, US continues with unilateralist policies, protectionist policies, restriction to trade, to investment, to movement of labor, and so on and so on, most of Central America and most of Latin America and most of the Caribbean is going to say goodbye to the United States, is going to say hello to China. Mexico is different because there is the new revised NAFTA. But that's a risk. But I don't know whether there is a vision and the leadership in Washington to realize that even if you have a more regionalization, it cannot be just uh, only US and maybe your northern and southern uh, borders and nobody else. Otherwise, essentially, you have massive decoupling, massive disintegration, massive fragmentation, and it becomes dangerous and you're at risk of losing Central America, Caribbean, and Latin America, economically, politically, and also geopolitically. That's a risk that I think is not fully understood yet in Washington. Say, China, during this crisis, their virus started in China, but China now is on a, a foreign policy offensive. They're giving foreign aid and medical supplies and other things like this all over the world. So they're building their soft power. The US has given peanuts, literally peanuts, and now is saying the border with Mexico is closed, and any immigration to the United States for the next few months is closed. This is not the way you make friends around the world. This is not the way you make friends in the Americas. That's a risk. Well, another question is, uh, you know, where do you see interest rates? But, but more importantly, you know, the market has reacted very quickly to anything that looks like a vaccine or a, a real possibility of a vaccine. What, what do you make of... of uh, the kinds of, of uh, information that is going to be required for markets to drop in the kind of volatility we see today? Well, you know, until two days ago, markets from uh, late March were in risk on mode, at least for US equities, not for EM equities, and even for other DM equities, the markets were more volatile. In the last two days, we're back to risk off with all prices in free fall all over the world, including the United States. I would say that, of course, for a while, the health news were worse than expected. More cases, more dead people. In the last few weeks, it looks like we're flattening the curve in many parts of the world, given mitigation policies, social isolation, and the market started to get excited. In my view, however, they're getting excessively excited. Why? If we restart economic activity as we need to, May, June, we're going to have a second wave in the summer. This uh, virus is going to go from northern to southern hemisphere. It's going to go back to the northern hemisphere by November and December. We're not going to have a vaccine before mid or late part of next year. Even when you have a vaccine, it's not going to be produced for everybody. Initially, who produces it? US, maybe Europe, for themselves. They're not going to send it, unfortunately, to Latin America. So there'll be even a fight on the vaccine. We don't know whether these antivirals or anti-inflammatory are working. And therefore, I think the market got ahead of the curve. They thought, hey, we have good news on the health side. We're going to reopen soon. 
everything's going to be fine. I think the health news are going to be a mixed bag. From now on, the real macro news are worse than expected. The policy news have surprised on the upside on the macro, but we're running out of the bullets. And the markets are way ahead of the data. And we're going to see a U-shaped recovery when the market that are in a V, they're seeing a V-shaped recovery of growth. And when I say markets, I mean U.S. equities, because if you're looking at European equities, it's not a V. If you're looking at emerging market equity, it's not a V, it's not even a U, it's an L right now. So unfortunately, I think that markets have been too optimistic in the last two or three weeks. Now there'll be a reality check. And what's happening with the oil and commodity markets is the beginning of that reality check. Unfortunately, even when we reopen, it's not black and white. It's not that we're closed or open. It's going to be gradual, sequential. We might have to reclose some things if the spread starts again. It's going to be stop and go and stop and go. And even if you reopen, who wants to go to a restaurant? Who wants to go in a crowded bar? Who wants to go in a stadium? Who wants to go where there are thousands of people and you can get sick? You can reopen everything and people are not going to show up. So the idea you're going to reopen, everything is fine, we're back to normal, is totally naive. It's totally naive. It's going to be very slow. It's going to be very anemic. It's going to be very gradual. It's going to be painful. And therefore, the economic losses, the loss of unemployed people, 22 million people lost their jobs in America. Those jobs are not going to come back rapidly. We lost in four weeks all the jobs we created in 10 years. It took 10 years to create those 22 million jobs. We lost them in four weeks. How many years is it going to take to restore the job growth? It's going to take us several years, maybe an entire decade. And this is in the U.S., where you have the best policy in terms of aggressive. Everywhere around the world, of course, we have more constraints on what we can do, starting with emerging markets, starting with the weaker economies in some parts of Latin America or other emerging markets. That's an unfortunate reality. We have to know it. And unfortunately, issues of solvency, you start with that question, are going to emerge. Some countries are insolvent and will have to restructure their debts. We'll have to have debt reduction for government, for banks, for households, for corporates, for the country. Some of them, of course, you want to do it intelligently and when it's necessary, and there is no other alternative. We have to face the fact there will be bankruptcies and insolvency, and that has to be part of the policy solution. Julia, I know we're running out of time, but this is a, an important question in terms of how do you see, um, you know, food commodities as opposed to mineral commodities? And as I was listening to you, you've always been a, a great uh, visitor to, to, to our countries. How long do you think we, it will take us to get tourism back up and running, which is critical, as you know, for many countries? Well, if you look at uh, commodities, all the, since the beginning of the year has dropped by 70%. Copper and other industrial metal has been, depending on the commodity, 20, 30%. But even ag prices, say the FAO came out with it on March and the average price of uh, food had fallen in March by 4% because you have a severe recession. People need to eat, of course. The demand for food falls less, but even food prices has fallen. So I would say in that spectrum of commodity, of course, the food prices are falling less. There is, however, another big problem that I see is facing. First of all, uh, even in the U.S., we might have bottlenecks in the supply chain for food. There have been a bunch of, uh, say, meat processing plants where you had coronavirus cases. They had to shut them down. Because we have restricted now migration, the Mexican workers will come to California to pick up the fruits and vegetables are not there. And therefore, over time, if we're doing more of these things, the supply chain for food is going to be limited. And the other thing is going to be happening is that countries are going to decide some industries are more national security. For example, anything to do with drugs and pharma, national security. We want our own masks, our own ventilators, our own direct products. We don't want to export them to other countries. That's going to disrupt global trade. It's like a restriction. And I fear that if this crisis remains and there are bottlenecks in the production of food, because maybe there is contagion, and in some parts of the world, the food supply process and chain is disrupted, then you could have a situation in which food prices can go higher and can't they going to say, sorry, we're not going to export. We're going to keep the food for our own people. And once you disrupt 
the global supply chain for food, that supply shock can have actually severe consequences because of course they have a global market for commodities, including food as well. So that's a risk that we cannot rule out. Today, food prices are going down, but if we're gonna start to mess around with supply chains and we have these disruptions, you could have a spike in food prices. And that's gonna worsen because people today, in many parts of the world, the US, they don't pay the rent, they don't pay their mortgages, they don't pay the electricity, water, and uh, utility bills, they don't pay their phone and internet, the banks are not gonna shut you down, they're not gonna cut you off, but they need food. That's the one thing they need. And they have barely the money to buy the food. If the price of food goes higher, we know the Arab uh, Spring started with food riots. And we know what happens in, around the world when food prices go higher. This is when you start seeing people rioting and going and, and looting at the supermarkets. That's a risk that we have to worry about. Tourism, I fear that tourism, unfortunately, is gonna be coming back very slowly. Even when you can move, most people are gonna say, I'm not sure if I want to go on an airplane and go to another country. I might just do tourism nearby or go in some uh, resorts in my own countries. And therefore, between the scale of uh, airplane and travel in airports and airplanes, and the fact that you have less income and less spending for discretionary, and you're worried about other countries and how safe they are, and they're worried about being in public places with lots of people, and you're worried even about the medical facilities of some of these countries, I fear that tourism is gonna come back very, very slowly. It's gonna be more domestic tourism. And for countries like in Caribbean, where 90% of the tourism is from abroad, that's gonna be a major shock. It's gonna take many years until people feel safe to go back to normal, and we may never go back fully to normal. This might be a permanent shock. Not as severe as now, of course, but something where the demand for those tourist services cross-border is gonna be lower gradually, even two or three years down the line. That's a risk. So the economic model of these countries may have to change. Well, thank you very much, Nouriel. And this has been, uh, as always with you, fascinating. Uh, the way you put all the linkages together, we live in a extraordinary time. Uh, uh, one we never expected to be where we're at. Uh, but I know uh, that a lot of your insights are something that many people uh, around our hemisphere are going to be following. And with that, I just want to thank you very much for being with us, for uh, giving us all the intellectual challenges that you have. And I will now turn it over back to Eric to do the close. Yeah, thank you, actually. Very honored to have done this thing with you. I read, actually, your economic output report. Is very good and it speaks not only about the challenges but also what can be done on the policy side. And yourself with your leadership of the great institution for many years, people like Eric and his team in research, I think you can really work well to make sure that while there will be significant damage, uh, the, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And it's key and important for this key region of the world. So I thank you for giving me a chance to have this conversation today. Thank you, thank you, Noriel. Eric. This has been an amazing event. So thank you very much, President Moreno, for this dialogue with Professor Rubini. And thank you, Nouriel, for your insightful comments and always provoking ideas. So I I'm, I'm really appreciate uh, both about this discussion that we have today. So we're planning to have more dialogue. We are planning to have more discussions about these important issues with a special focus on Latin America and the Caribbean. So we will keep you posted for new events. So thank you very much for all the people who has been with us today.